Good afternoon. Apparently, a lot of you all are qualified for the Postal Service. I uh, come in here through all kinds of weather uh, for, for the event. So welcome to the Humanities Forum, uh, and also to what is today the annual um, Lippitz Lecture to be delivered by Professor Rafael Falco, this year's Lippitz Professor of the Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. The Lippitz Professorship is supported by an endowment created by Roger C. Lippitz and the Lippitz Family Foundation to, and I quote, to recognize and support innovative and distinguished teaching and research in the arts, humanities, and social sciences at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. It is the preeminent such professorship in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Before introducing Professor Falco, um, I would like first to announce the selection of the Lippitz Professor of the Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences for academic year 2013 2014, and it will be Professor Linda Dussman of the Department of Music. And you may either remain sitting or standing while I say nice things about her. Um, a really distinguished composer and scholar. Professor Dustman joined UMBC in 2000 to chair the Department of Music. Her work as an artist and as a scholar uh, has involved especially, and in a variety of ways, works that focus on feminist issues in contemporary music and embody uh, a women's perspective. Her compositions have been performed and recorded both nationally and internationally, with 10 CDs published uh, and another in the planning. She's also written scholarly articles on feminist issue in contemporary music, and has founded a digital press for music by women composers. As a teacher and as a mentor, she hasn't only played a vital role with UMBC students, but has organized workshops for young composers aged 13 to 18. And she's been an important leader on campus in a variety of ways, most notably perhaps as chair of the Department of Music from 2000 to 2008, an absolutely pivotal time in which she took an apartment at Loeb. Indeed, there wasn't really very much water on the beach uh, when Linda came. They took an apartment at Loeb uh, and helped to make it the vibrant department that it is now, and the department with an enviable national and international reputation for excellence in new music. She used her Lippitz professorship especially to compose a new piano trio uh, commissioned by the European Trio des Alpes uh, and to expand her digital press. She is thus a most worthy recipient of the Lippitz Professorship, and I am delighted that she has been so honored and recognized. And I ask another round of applause for Professor Dustin. Mm -hmm. It's my equal pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Rafael Falco of the Department of English, who has also achieved a remarkable record in scholarship, in service, in leadership, in teaching. He joined UMBC in 1993 uh, and is one of the foremost scholars nationally and internationally of the English Renaissance. He is the author of several important books, another to be published this summer, uh, with still more in progress, and author as well of numerous articles in leading journals, as well as other scholarly contributions. He's written especially about the role of genealogy in Renaissance culture and the importance of charisma to the establishment of political and social authority in the era. Professor Falco is an authority as well on culture and mythology beyond the English Renaissance uh, and brings an important interdisciplinary sensibility to his studies. He's received important fellowships and distinctions for his scholarship. In addition to his scholarship, Professor Falco is an excellent teacher, offering a variety of well-received courses, and he served the English department, the university, and his profession in a variety of important capacities. An extraordinary mentor of undergraduates, he directs the English Honors Program and serves as faculty advisor to the UMBC <coughs> Review. Professor Falco will talk today on charisma in the age of digital reproduction. Raphael. Thanks, John. Uh, 
I'd like to begin by thanking the Lippitz Foundation for making possible the honorary professorship and the annual lecture. I'd also like to, to thank John Jeffries and last year's Lippitz Selection Committee for choosing me. I felt and feel genuinely honored to have been chosen. And finally, I must also express my gratitude to Jessica Berman, not only for her long-standing encouragement and support of my Lippitz candidacy, but also for her support of all my work over the years. And as John told you, it wasn't always exactly what my brief called for. <laughs> I, I planned at first to use as an epigraph to this talk Bob Dylan's line from Talking World War III Blues. I'll let you be in my dream if I can be in yours. My reason for choosing this line was that I'd always wanted to use this line. <laughs> Really? Closer? Is that better? Uh, OK, good. Say that one again. Can I say that again? OK. <laughs> My reason for choosing this line is that I always wanted to use the line. For whatever reason, it has always struck me as a great metaphor for life. But I also wanted to use it because I thought the image of two people in separate dreams somehow sharing their individual dream experiences describes an ideal aspiration for the charismatic <coughs> group experience in the realm of digital reproduction. I like the symmetry of the image. But as it turns out, I was naive. And I gave up the epigraph when I realized it could never describe the online group experience of charisma. So instead of an epigraph, let me begin with a disclaimer. <coughs> a fast-growing garden of research has been done on the many and variegated kinds of group formation in the new media, notably in the area of online gaming, where we encounter such phenomena as what Celia Parker, uh, Celia Pierce, AKA Artemisia, calls the emerging genre of massively multiplayer online worlds, variously known as, and I don't know if you pronounce these or you just say them, MMOGs, MMOWs, virtual worlds, and metaverses. Beyond gaming, there are political campaigns, religious movements, flash mobs, and of course, the Arab Spring. And beyond that, there's the draconian censorship of the internet in places like China, a form of censorship that seems to prove the value of digital sharing. Research on internet censorship is also growing, but I've done little more than push through the gates of this garden of research. And I've no doubt that I'll eat of the wrong tree and be tossed out of my ear by the grand webmaster. <laughs> Part one, charisma. Charisma is a complicated and debated topic, and I can't review all the different schools of thought this afternoon. But for the sake of this talk, charisma should be understood as having two basic and indispensable characteristics. Basic characteristic number one is that charisma is consummately a group experience. Although it might be popular to think of an individual having charisma, it's much more productive to understand how charismatic figures share their gifts. McDonald McIntosh put it this way, charisma is not so much a quality as an experience. The charismatic object or person is experienced as possessed by and transmitting an uncanny and compelling force. This force creates a need among followers, a kind of charisma hunger which compels them to develop an interdependent dynamic with the leader. But I'm not talking merely about celebrity or glamour. Charismatic authority involves a high level of commitment among followers, a sense of mission, and of the cost of belonging. From gang leaders to, Dick, to Bosnian generals, from C.G. Jung to Mahatma Gandhi to Nelson Mandela, Mao Zedong, David Koresh, or Aung San Suu Kyi, charismatic authority can only be defined as a shared group dynamic driven and limited by a leader's often revolutionary sense of mission. However, if we Google charisma, <laughs> if we don't exactly get what we want. In fact, 
the Google logarithm or code has got really has gotten it wrong. All of the genuine well, I mean, what's Madonna's mission? Really? <laughs> and would you follow Jim Morrison into Ethiopia? <laughs> Probably not. I don't even know who some of these people are, Robbie Williams and Richard Branson, but that I suppose is my fault. And if you believe Donald Trump has charisma, you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting, the real charismatics here who are associated with war in this main group uh, are all dead, except Clinton. I think Clinton did have charisma. The only true charismatic doesn't make it into the main group. The Dalai Lama is a divine figure. According to the choice of the Dalai Lama, priests go from village to village. Now, this has been tainted by politics, according to my friends who study Tibet. But priests go from village to village looking for a baby who most resembles the Buddha. And that baby becomes the next Dalai Lama. You can imagine all the Tibetan stage mothers. <laughs> hmm. Now, anyway. How do we get to the line of I know, I'm sorry, my fault. Okay. Basic characteristic number two is that charismatic groups, and therefore charismatic myth, the, the charismatic myths sustaining them, only thrive in an atmosphere of mild chaos and disequilibrium managed and manipulated by the leader. Disorder is the order of the day where charisma is concerned. In my view, Thomas Spence Smith revolutionized the somewhat stagnant field of charisma theory when in 1992 he applied the physicist Ilya Prigogine's notion of dissipative structures to charismatic groups, pointing out that organizing such groups depends on the generation of entropy and disorder rather than order. <clears throat> I agree. Charismatic group cohesion stems from the manipulation of destabilizing conditions. Leaders who introduce and manage these stabilizing conditions ensure both the survival of the group and, concomitantly, their own continued domination. There are scores of contemporary examples. But the best might be the latest intrigue at the Vatican, ostensibly the stable center of a static, charismatic institution. The ex-pope's resignation, extraordinary in history and probably forced on him, should make, make it clear how important managed disorder can be to the survival and domination of a charismatic cohort. Part two. Reproducibility. As many of you know, I've borrowed my title from Walter Benjamin's ce celebrated essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, or a better translation, The Age of Mechanical Reproducibility. This famous Benjaminian tag has been borrowed in many titles before now, but none, so far as I can find, have linked mechanical reproducibility with charisma. So this talk will examine the effect of reproducibility in digital media on charismatic groups. Benjamin's article was published in 1936. So his notion of reproducibility is largely confined to film and photography, the latter of which he refused to consider an art form anyway. Benjamin himself was a staggeringly impressive intellectual of the old school. But he was also, at the time of his article, a committed Marxist and materialist critic. As a result, his early training as what might be called an aesthetic absolutist or cultural connoisseur often comes into conflict with his later ideologically charged critique. This is particularly evident where his chief concern falls on the authority and authenticity of a work of art reproduced countless times by mechanical techniques. What withers in the age of technological reproducibility of the work of art, he says, is the latter's aura. An aura, he defines, as a strange tissue of space and time, the unique apparition of a distance, however near it may be. He cites a mountain range on the horizon or a branch that casts a shadow on its beholder. These aren't works of art, but are distinguished like works of art by their uniqueness. And according to Benjamin, it's this very uniqueness of the aura that is in decay. He's almost apocalyptic about the situation. The stripping of the veil from the object, he says, is the destruction of the aura. 
It's the signature of a perception whose sense of sameness in the world has so increased that by means of reproduction, it extracts sameness even from what is unique. He worried that the technology of endless repetition would devalue the here and now of the artwork. And he linked this devaluation to a shattering of tradition, which was, in his analysis, inseparable from the notorious mass movements of his day. Well, despite what sounds old-fashioned in his language, Benjamin hoped to overturn the staid 19th century ideas of art by creating a new field of aesthetics based on the conditions in which art was produced. As Antoine Aignan and Bruno Latour point out in an essay somewhat provocatively entitled How to Make Mistakes on So Many Things and Become Famous for It, Benjamin was one of the Frankfurt School authors who first re-envisioned socio-political critique for us. Older school Marxists, they say, disregarded technology in their analyses, but Benjamin and his colleagues taught us otherwise. Their point was that technique makes power, and they used the arts as an example. Though somewhat neglected during his short lifetime, Benjamin's observations on the social force of technique have proved more durable than those of many of his more famous contemporaries. He identified cogently and with originality a cultural dynamic that has since become a commonplace of mass media. I mean, of studies of mass media. I'm quoting, it might be stated as a general formula that this technology of production detaches the reproduced object from the sphere of production. By replicating the work many times over, it substitutes a mass existence for a unique existence. And in permitting the rep reproduction to reach the recipient in his or her own situation, it actualizes that which is reproduced. This is probably Benjamin's most successful application of, Marxist theory, of the Marxist theory of production to the aesthetic sphere. The alienation of the worker from the means of production is the familiar formulaic objection to industrialized capitalism. Benjamin brilliantly recognized how the same sort of alienation occurs at the juncture of mass technology and aesthetic production. He maintains that the technology of mass production detaches the reproduced work of art from the personal, unique sphere of production found in traditional representational forms. Consequently, in his view, the work of art loses its authenticity by being removed spatially, historically, and sensually from its original site into the local situation where, through mass technology, it can be actualized in every living room. We should be familiar with this notion of actualization since many of us sit in front of a screen all day. Then you mean obviously isn't referring to computer monitors, nor is he really talking about television. His target is film and the despots who used it. Their most powerful agent is film, he claimed. The social significance of film, even and especially in its most positive form, is inconceivable without its destructive, cathartic side. The liquidation of the value of tradition in the cultural heritage. Below this nostalgia for the value of tradition hardly sounds revolution, revolutionary, Benjamin couldn't be more right about the destructiveness of film's cathartic side. The eerie, telescoped physical transformations at the beginning of Lenny Riefenstahl's Olympia, in which the classical Greek statues metamorphose into the perfect naked bodies of what appear to be Aryan athletes, prove ben Benjamin's point. The technologically superb reproductions seem to enhance the value of and the charismatic draw of the original works of art and of the original Olympic spirit. But the original values are, are in fact lost in the distortions of the here and now. And the charismatic aura of the ancient gods and athletes, aesthetically preserved in marble, is transferred to a new reactionary political movement. OK, I'm gonna, just going to show a couple of minutes of this.
pay attention here. Anyway, you get the point. Bob Costas comes on and explains it. No, no. <laughs> when the marble discus thrower dissolves into an exact duplicate in living form, we have before our eyes a consummate loss of the uniqueness of the artwork. And at the same time, a virtual anthem to charismatic continuity. Riefenstahl deploys a mechanical form to reproduce the visions of art that then are reproduced identically as human athletes. This is a very clever technique because it seems to demonstrate how technology defeats erosion and augmenting and enhancing the presence of the past. But of course, it's the nationalist, social, national socialist present, the Nazi present, that Riefenstahl enhances. Although Olympia appears to, appears to translate charismatically one powerful tradition to its contemporary inheritor, the charismatic authority of exhibits is a creation of present day culture. Genuine charismatic authority exists, indeed needs to exist, both in the here and now and in the there and then. And it can't exist without creating a living myth of its revolutionary force, linked paradoxically to its continuousness with the past. Last week, John Jeffries spoke about being a continuarian in regard to history. Well, charismatic movements tend to survive when they affect a balance or compromise between a revolutionary overturning of present values and a form of continuarianism, if there were such a word. But we should never forget that the final version of the compromise is a myth of the present. Mass movements, the scourge of Benjamin's day, in your ben Benjamin's generation, were classic examples of the skillful manipulation of the technology of reproduction by rising charismatic authorities. Yet these movements also exemplified the equally skillful reinterpolation of authentic ethnic traditions and rituals often expressly in the name of preser preserving the lost aura of the past, thus creating a living myth of present day authority. Part three, collectives and charisma. Riefenstahl's film defines a collective, inviting an exclusive group of descendants to share values, a vision, and even a sense of authority over history. Not only does it devalue authenticity in art, Worse, he says, according to, worse, Benjamin says, and this is what really alarms him, because film is received in distraction, that's his phrase, it teaches people that technology will release them from enslavement to the vast apparatus surrounding them when they accept the totality of the conditions made possible by the new technology. Pretty good for a guy writing in 1936. He fears exactly the kind of common share established by Olympia. He fears, in other words, precisely the kind of conditions in which charisma flourishes, now new and improved by mechanical reproduction. Technological reproduction augments the authenticity of a group leader because his or her mechanically enabled presence enlarges group members' charismatic share. And most importantly, the charismatic share reproduces a sense of uniqueness in every group member, a sense of exclusion, of belonging, and finally, of belief. The static authenticity of a work of art is replaced by the dynamic, charismatically authenticated collective. Even long before the advent of digital media, mechanical reproduci reproducibility 
as manifest in radio, television, and film, involved a form of virtuality, a term defined usefully by N. Catherine Hales as the cultural perception that material objects are interpenetrated by information patterns. Although personal appearances still occurred and made a difference, think of the Nuremberg rally or the Long March or the I Have a Dream speech, the popular authority of figures like Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Churchill, Roosevelt, Kennedy, and King was far more a matter of media reproductions of the leader of the free world or the Fuhrer or FDR or JFK than at any earlier period of history. These were, in Hale's terms, interpenetrations of material presence and information patterns delivered through one or another form of mechanical reproduction. Each of these figures, for better or worse, became versions of tribal leaders in what Marshall McLuhan long ago called a global village. But this kind of popularity has been well researched. Scholars of charismatic authority as well as theorists of mass culture have masticated the great and evil charismatics of the 20th century for almost a, a century. Surprisingly, these same scholars have yet to sink their teeth into the effects of the digital revolution on charisma and its possible manifestations in online cultures. Most theories of charisma have been based not only on the occasional presence of the charismatic figure, but more importantly, on controlling the physical or virtual presence of followers. This requirement, by all appearance, has been obliterated by the World Wide Web and its unbarred access to media reproductions. Until very recently, access to reproductions was strictly controlled. Followers of Stalin, Hitler, Mao, or Martin Luther King participated in myths of socialism or fascism or racial freedom, primarily at a local level. If they couldn't be physically present at a rally, look at that. Their ability to share the charismatic, this he was just, he was, he was enjoying the talk. If they, <laughs> or trying to get to my jugular, I'm not sure. <laughs> if, he, if they couldn't be physically present at the rally, did, 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 did you follow that? Yeah, it was, I'm sorry for the interruption. If they couldn't be physically present at the rally, their ability to share in the charismatic movement required their obedience to a schedule of contact points, such as radio and television broadcasts, and to the discipline of face to face instruction from neighborhood cadres. Often, aided by you, you bic such ubiquitous propaganda as these paintings where Mao is always taller than everybody else. <laughs> in fact, Mao was pretty tall for a, for a guy of his time, but he wasn't taller than every single person in every picture or painting. Everything is staged. We don't even really know his height. Even though people claim to know his height, everything is faked. So it's, it's impossible really to know. Anyway. In contrast, digital reproduction in the new media environment creates private, unrestricted access to the source of charismatic authority. The immediacy of leader participant sharing at every digital port should, therefore, foster the necessary conditions for the validation of charismatic claims on a vastly augmented scale and without the normal delimitations of group participation. Also, the ubiquitous present, the presence of revolutionary posturing among new media heroes, the constant effort to de destabilize and fragment the pre-digital order, and the swiftly forming and dissolving groups attached to particular technological innovations should provide the basic elements of a charismatic dynamic, mild chaos and functional disequilibrium. And importantly, the reproducibility of the digital image grants to those digitally engaged as reproducing agents a sense of sharing the privileges and e exclusivity of group membership. With the addition of endowed leadership figures, charismatic authority, the most fluid form of authority, should thrive in the new media environment. But there's a catch. Part four, clericality. In the second edition of Understanding Media, after having dazzled and confused the public with the virally famous phrase, the medium is the message, Marshall McLuhan offered a clear explanation of what he meant. I'm sure you're familiar with the discussion, but I think it bears repeating in the context of my talk. He wrote, the medium is the message means, in terms of the electronic age, that a totally new environment has been created. 
The content of this new environment is the old mechanized environment of the industrial age. He adds that when we are using the new medium, we are aware only of the content of the old environment. Thus, the content of any medium, according to McLuhan, is always another medium. His examples are excellent. The content of TV is the movie. The content of the telegraph is print. The content of the electric light is what it illuminates, and so on. So the question I'd like to answer is, how does the content of the digital or new media environment affect the development of charismatic groups, which, as the Google logarithm, or Google code seem to prove, we only know as old media phenomena? The answer surprised me. Like most scholars, I spend a great deal of time using and revering digital media. So one day I found myself in a flush of scholarly zeal, re <laughs> reading an online version of a 17th century book about fresh French customs. Okay, La doc Doctrine de Meur, it's called. Okay, there I am. Actually, I was looking for a genealogical plate of of French customs. So it took me a few, it took a few minutes for the nickel to drop. The pages were turning. I woke up, sat back, and asked myself, why are the pages turning? Why the illusion of actually sitting in the Bibliothèque Nationale? Is this a parody of McLuhan's statement that the meaning of a new medium can only be the content of an older medium? Or, more to the point, is the older content a printed text or is it animation itself, maybe even stop motion animation? My conclusion, as I hope becomes clear in a moment, was that the older media content was animation itself. But before we move on, what about the digital reader turning the pages? This is the real puzzle. Mine was a mild and short-lived moment of delusion. Yet it nonetheless characterizes an online phenomenon I'd like to call clericality. Hmm. Yet, and I, by the way, clericality is a phenomenon directly related to Benjamin's notion of, that film is received in detachment. And please excuse me for introducing still another neologism into a field choked with them. But I found this concept useful in theorizing the digital economy of charismatic authority. Clericality, as you can see on the screen, is it on the screen? Yeah, clear, uh, contains elements of kleros, share or allotment, a concept Max Weber first noted to be the root not only of cleric, but also of the charismatic share. And the word sharing, this is most important for us, has become ubiquitous in internet discourse, which is where the World Wide Web comes in. Because there's a difference between undifferentiated content and a connected web of consumers. David Bell cites the term prosumers, referring to those who produce and consume an interactive element of shared content. He describes the web as a way of managing content on the internet based on shared protocols and standards. There's no denying how important sharing has become, but we should be alert to the false sense of allotment present at all times among prosumers. The great Tim Berners-Lee, whose bust should be on Mount Rushmore, said that in, you know who Berners-Lee is? He in, okay, most of you do, right? He, he, sort of invented the web. Is invented the right word? I'm not sure, but anyway. Said that in creating the web, okay, created the web. Said that in creating the web, he thought chiefly of how, in his words, once a bit of information in the global information space had an address, quote, a computer could represent associations between things that might seem unrelated, but somehow did, in fact, share a relationship. The key word here is not share, important as sharing, the practice of sharing is. 
the key word is representation. Computers represent associations, according to Berners-Lee. So when we speak of sharing on the web, we should recognize or underline the fact that representations are being shared. Here, again, Benjamin's question of authenticity echoes, because the meaning of sharing utterly changed when it no longer referred to represented associations between computers, but instead between digital media and represented human beings. Bell calls attention to the moment when email arrived on the scene, and the internet, once used only to give computer access computers access to each other in military and scientific communities became a part of everyday life. The transition from machine access to human need redefined the meaning of digital sharing, while at the same time suppressing the representational content of the media. Add to this, add to this sudden emphasis on human presence the multiplication of personal digital devices. The result is a revolution of tectonic proportions for representational media. A revolution best compared not to the invention of movable type, as is so often claimed, but rather to the discovery and implementation of linear perspectives in the 15th and 16th centuries. No doubt an internet scholar has already said this. But the point is vital. If we want to comprehend the systematic isolations and exclusions we experience in online media, there are, these are more a matter of perspectival environments than, a, than of warp speed disseminations. Berners-Lee maintained that computers shared a relationship, but sharing has become a lure to human connection. At once the byword of networking groups and the bonding agent between online personalities. To share is, by, digi by the digital barometer, to belong. However, and I think this is crucial, the representational origins of all digital media have been lost or ignored or too well masked. Therefore, I'd like to emphasize that clericality is not pure sharing. In Ecclesiastes, kleros is the, is the clergy as opposed to the laity. Thus, following this etymological pattern, clericality implies priesthood and hieratic pr privilege but the etymology extends in idiomatic speech to include clerkship, which is usually associated with filing and typing. That is, manual and digital action. This key, the keyboard, therefore, engages a dialectic between participation and inclusion and gradually, by degrees of interactive agency, also increases the participant's share in the charismatic allotment. Therefore, it's reasonable to merge hieratic clericality with digital engagement, which grants to reproducing agents or prosumers a sense of sharing the privileges and exclusivity of group membership. Like priests in their cells, digital group members experience the exclusivity of privilege, despite or because of the utter deprivation of human contact. But here's the catch I mentioned. Whereas priests can leave their cells and remain part of a relatively stable, charismatic myth system, online group members are trapped because their share in the charismatic group functions as a result of a representational association. Put more as a theoretical proposition. The digital reproduction will always be in conflict with the ongoing transformative engine of its own reproducibility. The representational nature of the production will always displace the charismatic myth maker and destroy genuine group cohesion. So I can't be in your dream and you can't be in mine after all, regardless of what you think is happening online. Charisma per se can't survive, simply can't survive in a new media environment. This isn't to say there aren't charismatic groups that use the media, the new media. There are, of course, leaders of every stripe have web designers and hot, you know, live links. But as far as I can determine, these sites presume an already existing charismatic movement, usually religious, but sometimes secular. The websites function as information sources or calls to prayer. But the charismatic authority functions offline. 
in an institutionalized environment that promises by its very existence to satisfy followers' needs despite the representational nature of online relationships. Digital gaming is a good analogy for the representational conundrum of online charismatic groups because both types of collective enterprises are what Bernard de Coven once described as forms of social fiction that exist only as they are continually created. Which means that in both cases their contents, the message of the medium, is not social fiction but the reality of reproducibility. Just as the content of that online book and its turning pages was probably animation itself, the content of digital charismatic groups, like the content of gaming, is the mechanism of their, repro of their representation. Games, according to Lisbeth Clattrop, must create a poetics to preserve themselves. She says, to maintain a sense of worldness, a virtual world must create an aesthetic, a syntax, a vocabulary, and a framework that is extensible, sustainable, and robust. <coughs> Significantly, she adds, the very mechanisms of exploration are elements of worldness. I'd argue that the same focus on the mechanisms is central to the formation and continuation of charisma in the age of digital reproduction, which produces an exceptional situation. Digital charismatic figures must aestheticize the technology of reproduction in order to create a myth of their own perpetuation. They too must develop a kind of personal poetics, which means, unfortunately for them, that charisma bearers would have to destabilize the form and mechanism of their own reproducibility to maintain a working dissipative structure. You'll recall basic characteristic number two. Walter Benjamin ideas of authenticity and authority are flipped on their head, and I hope he's chuckling in his grave. Because where online charisma is concerned, the aesthetic form destroys its own aura. The digital engine of reproduce, reproducibility excuse me, is cannibalistic, which points to the most glaring conflict between typical charismatic authority and online or what might be called representational charisma. Despite the many illusions of beauty, glory, and supremacy we find in charismatic myths, the key factor for a charismatic group is expediency on the part of the leader and an aura of authenticity and stability in aestheticized objects, crosses, swastikas, totems. And yes, leaders act to shift and destabilize the status quo as a means of maintaining power and at the same time enhancing the vitality of the charismatic myth. But typical charismatic leaders wouldn't be concerned at all with the aesthetic implications of their actions. It would be nonsense, for example, if the Pope were to issue a papal bull to improve the beauty of canon law rather than, as recently happened, canceling limbo because it wasn't canonically supported. Aestheticizing because it tends to set forms in place, can conflict with the fluidity needed for the survival of a charismatic group. <laughs> the, the ancient Greeks used the word idiotes to describe a person isolated, private, and removed. In Latin, the word idiota gained the overwhelmingly negative connotation it has today. Indeed, today the original Greek meaning of the word has been lost. But maybe we should allow a palimpsest of the original meaning to remain visible. Maybe we should recognize in our new media world of digital agency, what I called our world of clericality, that the apparent privilege of belonging to an online group, the sense of mass participation only masks by means of the medium itself and impenetrable isolation. This isolation is consummate idiocy, a modernized conflation of utter privateness in digital practice with foolishness of believing that digital practice, which is inseparable from isolation, can provide a genuinely charismatic group experience. 
and to think you aren't alone when in fact you must be alone to experience the medium might, in another context, be called madness or delusion, or more mildly what Slavoj Žižek calls interpassivity. This is a tricky term, a little too ambiguous for my taste, but as Jody Dean says in her discussion of Žižek, people are interpassive when they contribute to the info stream and believe that it matters, that it means something and that their contribution to circulating content is a kind of communicative action. Dean is describing inauthenticity. And it's because of this inauthenticity of participatory experience in the realm of digital worldness that establishing the group share can be impossibly elusive. Here's Gustave Dore's engraving of Satan addressing the Stygian Council of Fallen Angels in Book Two of, Par of Milton, John Milton's Paradise Lost. All of those gathered around the high throne of Pandemonium were the great seraphic lords and cherubim, recently thrown out of heaven, incidentally. Yet, led by that bad em eminence, Satan, they think they're still part of a charismatic group. But here's the rub, or yet another catch. Satan can never have charisma, because charisma literally means gift of grace. And once he rebels, Lucifer, the brightest of the seraphim, can never have grace or charisma again. He is constantly changing, continually becoming something diminished, something different, something without an aura. He is compelled to aestheticize his representation of himself, of his erstwhile stature, and of his doomed ambition. Satan is a perspectival nightmare, a sign without a signified. But despite appearances, he can never again have divine authenticity. So Doré, using the digital technology of his day to represent Satan's stature, is mistaken in portraying Satan as a charismatic leader in this engraving, if that's what we're supposed to be seeing. Each one of those fallen angels is, in fact, trapped in his own delusion of a false charismatic claim. Each one is suffering from a hopeless case of interpassivity. And that isn't all of it. Milton has set another trap. If undiscerning readers think Satan is a charismatic figure, then they, too, along with poor old William Blake, will fall into the trap and become prisoners of delusion and systematic exclusion from the Christian myth of paradise. I wonder, finally, if this same trap, mutatis mutandis, afflicts charisma in our age of digital reproducibility. And I'm especially curious to know what myth of paradise online followers expect their leaders to create. Thanks. <laughs>